I am Fatu Jain Sengo. I work for Article 19, uh, uh, which is a freedom of expression organization. I'm a human rights advocate with more than 20 years experience. I've been working with Article 19 for the, uh, since 2002. Prior to working with Article 19, I've been working here in the Gambia as a human rights lawyer for a human rights organization called the Institute for Human Rights and Development. In natural questions, will you please uh, share with us in how freedom of uh, expression and freedom of the press has evolved in West Africa and what have been the obstacles, uh, the recurrent obstacles uh, in the region? Uh, thank you. Uh, the, I think the evolution has been uh, uh, not linear as I as you can see from the early 90s, when we have a lot of changes in, on the, in the region due to the national conferences, we saw a liberalization of the airwave. We've, seen also, we've seen also uh, press freedom growing. Uh, and uh, linked to that, uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, media pluralism in terms of uh, newspaper setting, uh, in terms of also establishing of uh, uh, regulatory body that were more or less in some countries independent. Uh, but uh, in some of uh, our work, as I said, we work on freedom of expression and access to information. What we've noticed also, despite all those macro trends, there have been pockets of uh, resistance in terms of law reform. And we've noticed that despite the evolution, there have been lots of resistance from governments to uh, to liberalize properly in, by way of uh, enacting laws that are conducive, laws that are enabling uh, for, for media freedom. So we've seen uh, uh, in terms of those uh, uh, quite a lot of restrictions. At the continental level also, uh, in the late 90s to, to early 2000, we've been seeing a lot of interest in terms of trying to get the regional mechanisms really to be uh, okay with uh, what was happening across the different countries, but also to evolve. As you know, we have uh, regional mechanisms uh, at the ECOWAS level, but importantly, the one of the oldest one is the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And in the early 2000s, uh, they've engaged with uh, uh, civil society, media actors across the continent to really rethink uh, a framework that will help to protect better journalists, but also to address the issues that we've been talking about this since the morning, the issues of impunity and also uh, the risk of the repression against journalists. So in 2002, I was uh, privileged to be part of a team that uh, led uh, the, 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 the discussion and also ultimately supported the African Commission to enact a uh, uh, what we call uh, the Declaration of Principle on Freedom of Expression in Africa, which was a landmark decision at that time because uh, there was nothing in terms of protection of journalists except uh, the Article 9 of the African Charter, which uh, uh, protects uh, the right to freedom of expression, but has been abused for many times by the different governments. So the declaration was adopted with the support of our organization and many other organization across Africa and beyond uh, took part in those consultations uh, which we led. And uh, subsequent to that, we encouraged the commission to set up a mandate, a special mandate or that will oversee the implementation of the declaration, but also that will give a little bit priority to freedom of expression and media freedom, because we've realized that more and more journalists were aggressed. There were a lot of uh, uh, killings uh, across the region which with impunity, so we thought that the commission needed to use its powers, both uh, uh, its promotional powers and also its uh, legal uh, in terms of setting the framework, but also in terms of also ensuring that uh, it can adjudicate on some of those cases. So in a nutshell, uh, the early years of my undertaking with Article 19 has been revolving around supporting the African Commission to set up the special report uh, mechanism uh, that will be supporting the implementation of the, the, the declaration. Uh, in 2010, we realized that 
after many years of working across Africa to a South African office, but also to working on a lot of policies, training for journalists, but also for members of the judiciary. It was important really to, to look into uh, the safety of journalists in a more practical. And with our mm -hmm. office in Mexico, we worked closely uh, on different cases, but Gambia was one of the countries where we focused quite a lot of our energy due mm -hmm. to the fact that it was quite repressive to be a journalist in the Gambia. Uh, the human rights violations were quite uh, important and uh, uh, the climate of fear was the order of the day and there was no effective mechanisms or remedies for journalists who were oppressed at that time. So when we set up our office in Senegal, we took it upon ourselves really to focus quite a lot of attention on the Gambia to support journalists and human rights defenders. Quick questions. We were focusing on, on the causes and what drives impunity, and it's important to to have a deeper knowledge for the tribunal of West Africa and Africa at large. What would you think will be um, what was driving such impunity? The, the difference, not all the countries change. Uh, in government and in, in, in shapes of those governments, and, and regardless, the impunity persists. I'm not sure if, are you there? Are you still there? Yeah, I, oh. I didn't get your last question. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, we lost, for, we lost you for a minute. Let me just rephrase it. And, uh, we were just trying to understand what drives impunity in, in the region. And as you were pointing out, we had moments of dictatorial regimes, but that was not uniform with the different countries, and, and yet impunity seemed persistent in all these countries. So I was just questioning whether you were able to identify in your experience what was driving this impunity in the region. Uh, uh, as I said, like, uh, you know, the situation uh, are quite different from one country to the other. But I think uh, if you look at the overall, we can say that there were countries that were quite advanced in a sense of relative uh, freedom of expression, you know, after the 90s, such as Ghana, such as uh, Senegal. But um, uh, later on, I think we've seen those gains, you know, being... Uh, uh, reverse, but I think I just want to pause maybe on the, around that time between the uh, the 90s and uh, and the two, early 2000 to 2010. We've seen I think some countries growing in the region, as I mentioned, uh, except few. But countries like Gambia, probably Mauritania, were the few countries that really were considered as very close, not having at all uh, press freedom uh, because of uh, the nature of uh, the regime. They were still governed by semi-military regime. And for those countries that have evolved, there was a lot of, change, lot of challenges, like a country uh, such as Burkina, of course, with, uh, uh, excuse me. She's... Um... No. When you're ready, take your time. You realize the circumstances. I always have my child running behind me when I'm on Zoom. I'm just trying to. Yeah, so just sorry. That's all right. Thought everything was sorted. So a country, for example, like also Burkina is a case in point. I'm sure you... Uh, know the case of uh, Norbert Zongo, who was an investigative journalist quite known by his peer, very influential, he was killed. As we speak today, also his case is not resolved 100%. And I think you have situation where uh, countries who move from slightly, you know, repressive to opening up democracy, you still have uh, issues of journalists being killed. That was the case also of Nigeria, where even though They've uh, they moved from um, the military regime in the late 90s. We still have a lot of repression, a lot of uh, violence against journalists. But I just want to pause on some of the cases that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the case of the Haidara in a country that was military uh, repression, the case of Nobel Zongo. And uh, lately we've seen that all the countries that have progress and that were kind of uh, 
examples such as Ghana are sliding back, and these are things. Also, these are trends also that we we, we are noticing with the increase of uh, civic uh, closure of civic space, with the increase also of repression of uh, dissident voices. We are noticing more and more violence against journalists in the region. Um, Vatu, you also mentioned, and, and today was mentioned in several locations, in, oh, in the context of, of Southeast Asia by uh, Ms. Reza, the, that the, the trend of enacting and passing laws criminalizing the work of journalists or stigmatizing the work of journalists, that would, had also been mentioned in the context of the African region, and I was wondering if, through your work, is this a pattern in the region and you have some additional information about that? Uh, yes, uh, we, we've noticed that laws have been used across the board to, to legitimize repression. And now, uh, uh, as I mentioned, despite the opening up the liberalization, the proper reforms have not taken place in most countries. They have countries that have enacted, for example, that have decriminalized partly defamation, but they still have other provisions such as insult laws, such as, you know, insult to institution that are generally used. And those laws, if you look at them, they are quite overbroad and left to the discretion of authorities. And they can, they are frequently used to intimidate journalists. And what we've noticed is that in, in, in most cases, uh, it's the early hours of the detention that a lot of things happens, the beating, the torture, but also the intimidation, because most of the journalists, we, we, we documented some cases, for example, from the Gambia and beyond. Most of the journalists, when they, uh, when they leave prison, even if they are not condemned at the end, or they are given uh, uh, they, they long sentences, generally that instill fear. And most of the case, most of cases, after sometimes prison, we've seen that the editorial line will change and we see them generally, uh, you know, self-censoring because uh, the lack of proper, proper, proper remedy and the fact that everybody believes that some of the judiciaries are not independent. Once you have to deal with the law and you are taking to those uh, unfair processes, generally people or come out with uh, with big differences, and we've noticed many journalists quit their jobs because of the, the legal harassment, and sometimes also because of the beatings that also have never been remedied. And I want to say also, uh, I think some of the previous speakers mentioned uh, beyond the killings, also there are some other intimidation that have really, really big impact on 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 the media, uh, especially you know the the legal harassment, we've seen cases where journalists will be called to, re to report to police frequently. And also they have been monitored, spied upon. At the end of the day, I think also that creates like a psychological threat that are so, so, so heavy on, on, on journalists that most of them uh, also feel, even though they are not physically attacked, but the impression of lack of safety also is there. And that has a negative impact also on their lives and, and, and the people around them, especially their family. And they receive a lot of, lot of family pressure, especially female journalists, to, to quit the job uh, when, when those harassments are there. And lastly, beyond the regional measures that you measures in the context of ECOWAS, uh, the, the, what would you think needs to be done to most effectively investigate in, in well, from pre prevention to the investigation and persecution, but to really put an end on the impunity uh, with, in relation to the murder of journalists in the region? Um, I, I, I think, uh, uh, well, before I touch on the preventive measures, I do believe that, for example, if some of those cases that are quite clear cut are, are addressed uh, in some of the countries, and then a good example is sent by the authorities that you know they don't condone impunity, I think that will send a signal to the security forces, that will send a signal to the non-state actors that are sometimes committing those violations, and also to politicians that they cannot attack journalists and harm them without consequences. And I think we need to continue to push for those cases, no matter how long it takes for them to be resolved. Because I think 
if we if we dis, we are discouraged and we believe that after 20 years, 15 years, some of these cases are not resolved, so they will never be resolved. I think one day or the other they will be resolved. But now coming to what we should do to ensure that at least we have preventive uh, mechanisms so that we avoid uh, you know irreparable harm. I do believe that uh, what we've started to see is that the, the the working together of the different mechanisms to set standards is quite important. Uh, they need to be uh, doing more uh, joint uh, activities in terms of ensuring that, for example, uh, they encourage certain states to set up mechanisms that will help really to uh, to investigate when something happens, but also to ensure that law enforcement authorities understand their, uh, their responsibility vis-a-vis uh, -vis of attacking journalists. And uh, civil society is doing quite a lot, but I do believe that there is a big gap uh, on uh, some of these uh, human rights bodies that are quite legitimate in terms of their mandate should be doing more vis-a-vis -vis of national governments, not, not only just to send report or go from time to time to mission, but I think they need to work together, like the UN Special Rapporteur, working together with that of the African Commission and others, really to, to come up with a clear, a clear part on how they want to implement uh, the, the UNESCO Action Plan on, uh, on Security of Journalists and all those other standards that they have been developing over the past two decades, really to, to, to do an assessment and see where we are and push national government to be part of the conversation. I know it's difficult, but I think it is very important and also uh, pushing also national government to implement the existing decisions. In our region, we have a lot of decisions from the ECOWAS court, from the African Commission, and the problem we are having is that uh, they are not implemented by national government, so they are not complying with their, 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 their own human rights obligation. And I think we need also to put pressure for some sanctions to be activated across those regional bodies. Wonderful. Thank you very much. But thank you.